London, just a city dragging itself up by its cranes to ever new heights of unaffordability. It's been that way for years now, right? It's just a playground for the super wealthy and their offspring. And I'm not from that sort of background myself, regardless of what you may think from the way that I just pronounced the word years. <laughs> I'm not, it's just a voice, this is genuinely true. During the last year for which I have available data, the high school I went to sent more people to ISIS than Oxbridge. <laughs> Let you guess which way I went? <laughs> Pleasure to be here, Allahu Akbar, lock the doors. <laughs> You might think the last line's obviously a joke. I'll get letters. <laughs> I'll get letters. Genuinely, I get strangers anonymously contacting me online insisting that I want to impose Sharia law on the West, which, as the atheist son of Hindu parents, makes me feel ever so naughty. <laughs> Sharia, moi. <laughs> and now, look at me. Regular guy on the BBC at Christmas time. Yeah. Yeah. Although, although, admittedly, owing to the BBC's diversity regulations, because I'm on the bill, you now have to refer to it as Krishna time. <laughs> I know, right? O.M. Ganesh. <laughs> Lots of differences between the generations. Uh, my favorite Christmas film is Die Hard. My dad's still waiting for the Hindu remake. Die Hard, get reincarnated, die even harder. <laughs> it's been an interesting time this year. Lots of changes in my area at the moment, right? Uh, my part of London is undergoing a lot of rapid uh, gentrification, they call it, right? I don't know if I can be a gentrifier because... <laughs> I've gentrified a place in the past. I work in the arts, don't get me wrong, right? I remember a while ago I lived in a place called Streatham in South London, and when I came towards the end of my tenancy, I remember walking to the station and realizing that overnight a minicab office had been replaced by a vegan bakery, and I was like, my work here is done. <laughs> it's different from the way that it used to be, you know? When my grandparents came to this country, my grandparents came to this country with nothing, and yet they were able to start a family here, they were able to build a life for them, they were able to own property, largely because they drove down house prices in every neighborhood they went to, but they were able... <laughs> property. It's not like that anymore for the different generations, right? So what do the young people do? You wait, you're probably watching this at home, all the generations together at last at Krishna time. <laughs> All of the young people waiting for a grandparent to cough and hoping that that's what's finally going to get them on the property ladder. <laughs> the problem is, as with any kind of inequality, with intergenerational inequality, the deck is stacked and we pretend it's a question of priorities that's made outcomes not identical, right? The number of times that I've heard, oh, you're worried you'll never get on the housing ladder, but you'll spend three pounds on one of your fancy coffees, yeah? yeah. Oh, yeah, well, you'll never get a little flat, but you'll spend three pounds on one of your fancy coffees. Bruv, that's because you bought all the three pound houses. <laughs> Few of those left, I'd prioritize that over a gingerbread latte. That is not the world that we currently live in, right? Guys, I currently, as an individual, earn more than both of my parents did put together, adjusted in real terms, when 23 years ago they bought a four-bedroom detached house in North London. The problem is my fondness for brunch. <laughs>